Heather, really great to have you here. It's been over two years, I think, since the festival. And I have we have we seen each other since? I don't think we have. I don't think we have. I think it's been maybe just a little under two years, wasn't it? It was May, I think, um, twenty nineteen, uh, that you put that you put on that fabulous uh, day long event with Brett and me and Ian McGilchrist and our friend Jordan Hall. Um, I think it was May 2019, and I don't think we've seen each other since then. I think that's right. No, but an awful lot has happened since. <laughs> it sure has. It feels like a bit more than two years. Yeah, maybe let's bring it up to date with how have you been and how has been the exploration of the podcast, especially because you, you've you really adapted to, to COVID in terms of making it into you and Brett talking about things and doing a regular updates. How's that been like that whole exploration? It's been, it's been great uh, actually. Uh, and if you had told me really even two years ago, um, but certainly five, 10, 20, 30 years ago that I would be uh, spending a considerable amount of time and enjoying doing it by speaking off the cuff to you know, thousands of people I don't know. Um, I would have said, you, you haven't met me. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Um, I came to love interacting with people through, you know, through voice rather than through writing, which is really my first passion and how I, my preferred mode of communication through the 15 years of teaching at Evergreen. Um, but I still never thought that it would be something that I would be actively choosing to do on a regular basis. And so, in fact, when Brett, Brett had been talking about starting a podcast, I think actually before, while we were still professors, uh, and then he set it up, what would that have been? I guess shortly after the event, um, the event in London with with you guys, with Rebel Wisdom, probably summer of 2019. And he did a few um, and they were great. You know, he's, he's, he's really good at it. And then as COVID was falling on the entire planet and we found ourselves without, you know, we were, we were losing access to the studio um, that had been built downtown for us. And also we didn't even begin to imagine, but as it turns out, it wouldn't have been a place that we would have wanted to be going anyway on the regular. Um, and so over the course of a few days, Brett and our older son, Zach, who was of yesterday is 17, but was then 15, um, <clears throat> Yeah, it would have been before his 16th birthday. Um, basically dismantled that studio and built this in our home. Um, and um, meanwhile, as COVID was beginning to become what everyone was talking about, he and I were talking about what we were seeing from the media that seemed wildly inconsistent with what had to be true. You know, things like, if this is a respiratory virus, how is it that the U.S. Surgeon General and the WHO are telling us that masks um, won't help? Right. So um, knowing, knowing something about what was to come and yet obviously having no ability to foresee the vast majority of what this last 13 months ish has been, uh, we kind of said, you know what, let's just let's just do a live stream and talk about COVID. And that was in March of last year, March 24th, I think. Um, and it quickly became effectively something that we could do to give us meaning while everything was shutting down. And we were almost immediately, like maybe immediately getting feedback from people that it was, that it was not just helpful, but comforting in a good way uh, to have people exploring ideas in real time with a scientific bent, but also with um, a humanist bent uh, and trying to understand, you know, willing to come back you know, whenever we made errors that felt substantive to us, I'm sure we've made lots of little errors that we didn't come back to correct, but especially early on, we did make errors and we came back the very next time and said, okay, this is, you know, this is something we said that wasn't true. So um, it was the first thing I've done really since I haven't been in the classroom um, as a professor that has felt a bit like um, a bit like that. And there's plenty that's educational in writing and in doing, you know, in, in doing the Rebel Wisdom Summit and some, several of the other events that I've done, you know, back when live events were possible. But um, being able to hear from people uh, that it's both useful at an analytical level and at a sort of human, human level is, is wonderful. Hmm. Yeah. And I guess there's a, a strong overlap between teaching and doing what you're doing now. And 
There is, yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I wonder, you, you mentioned that you've had, the, one of the things you've been doing is kind of doing a rolling correction of, of what you've been saying. And what have been the main themes that have come up? And what are, what are some of those corrections or some of those things that you've uh, established and then gone over? And what do you think you've uncovered? And what do you think that you you got wrong in that time? Well, that's that's a, several large questions right there. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> we, we, we definitely started um, with an almost exclusive focus on COVID. Um, although even in the early episodes, um, I mean, in fact, actually the the what would it be? The eighth anniversary of my father's death just passed a few days ago. And a year ago, I talked about what he had meant to be on air. And that had obviously had nothing to do with COVID. And then we talked in a way that felt natural at the time about peer review in the same episode. Um, and so although it feels like the, those first two months when we were actually doing um, twice weekly uh, podcasts, it was almost exclu exclusively COVID. It also, we brought in other things. Obviously, death was on people's minds. And how do we care for people when we aren't even allowed, um, you know, when many people aren't even being allowed to see their loved ones if they're in hospital as, as they're dying? Uh, or the question of peer review back in the early days, it was, it felt like the wild west in terms of the scientific literature in the early days of COVID in a good way. Like it was extraordinary what was being just put onto the preprint servers that are usually behind paywalls, that are usually um, obstructed from view. And then who knows what has happened in the peer review process, in the editing process, how long it's been, you know, what didn't get published. And so having you know, anyone who thought they had some data that they had been able to analyze that was relevant to what the entire world was going through a year ago was able to put those those studies up on preprint servers and we could all see them. So that was that was extraordinary. And we we took apart, we analyzed in some depth a few papers. And you know, I think came back, if memory serves, came back a few times and said, okay, you know, we got this thing a little bit wrong. Um and you know, there were there were things, you know, we were being, for instance, extraordinarily careful early on about about fomites with COVID, right? You know, the 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 idea that we were potentially going to get this from surfaces. And I'm not actually sure we even came back with a correction, but we have since talked a lot about, you know what, we just don't have to, you don't have to wash your groceries. You don't have to leave them in the car for, you know, three hours before bringing them inside. Um, but that was something that, that we thought was true. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been saying from the very beginning is this doesn't seem to transmit outside. So go outside. And so that's, that's one of the through lines. You know, I'm, I'm not a virologist. I'm not a public health expert. You know, I'm not an epidemiologist, vaccinologist, any of these things. And uh, the book that Brett and I have coming out later this year does have a couple of chapters on um, what our bodies are and what how they are interfacing with the modern world, and also on how medicine is interfacing with that. Um, but uh, but that is from you know the same the same level as we talk about food and sleep and sex and gender and relationship and you know just a, a ton of other topics. So um, being able to say, oh, by the way, the things that we actually care most deeply about, the evolutionary lens and actually the natural world um, in this case, in this pandemic, uh, and it will probably be true for many, for many such diseases if they're respiratory in nature, you go outside and um, you're far safer than if you are inside. And so that, that allowed a pivot to... Um, to some of the more political things. And of course, when when George Floyd died and the protests started worldwide, and then in some cities, the riots started reliably, including, you know, by some chance, <laughs> the city which I now call home, Portland, Oregon. Um, we, did, we did spend a lot of time last summer talking about that. And definitely not my favorite thing to be talking about, but it's, you know, it's, it's a theme that comes up over and over again. And I'm sure that we've, um, I'm sure that we've misinterpreted some of what we've seen in both directions, probably. Um, but as long as misinterpretations are happening in both directions, I think we're probably on on the right path, or at least close. Yeah, and I think a lot of people have a sense of the pandemic as a as a sort of pressure test to the system, a, a shock to the yeah. system that has pressure tested many things. You could say sense making is one of them. You could say institute lots of the institutions. What is your sense of the 
where it's tested them the most and which ones do you think have um, struggled or seem to have buckled the most? Hmm. Um, well, I wonder, I wonder if it's possible for those of us not on the inside of, you know, I, let's, let's leave it for the moment to decide the inside of what exactly, if we can determine what is buckling and what, um, you know, let's see, what was I going to say here? Um, what is actually being tested and what is being revealed to us as if it's being tested, like what's failing, um, because it was, it was ready to fail anyway. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, for instance, a year ago now, April, May, some people were saying, ah, this is going to be the end of woke. This is the, you know, this is it. Finally, we have something real that we can, we can focus on. And, Unfortunately, what this has revealed is, um, I guess, I guess for for you, probably for your audience, for me, uh, for my audience, which I'm sure there's a tremendous overlap. Um, I'm not surprised to see further evidence that the media is captured and the medical system is captured and the governmental institutions that are trying to make and enforce policy are are captured. And to what degree are all of them captured? I don't know. But uh, at the point last June, I think, when over well over a thousand public health officials and and doctors and such signed a letter proclaiming that um, racism was the real pandemic, uh, at, that felt like uh, it, it just felt like a kind of end. And there have there felt like a lot of ends here, but that felt like one of the ends of of discourse, like. We are literally, the world is relying on you and people like you as public health officials, as people with an understanding of what this virus is, hopefully, um, to, to help us out here. And you are making a, pro, a pronouncement that is so explicitly political and so unactionable at the epidemiological level. Um, how, how can we possibly trust you now? And so, the, you know, the breakdown of... Um, what turns out to have been misplaced trust uh, is, I'm not sure it exactly addresses your question, but I think that's the thing that has been revealed to even more people than those many of us who knew that that was already happening. You know, the breakdown of sense making was happening, but it just like the onions getting smaller and smaller, you know, the layers are being peeled off and off and off. And um, I don't think that analogy is exactly right because I don't think there's a single kernel at the at the middle. You know, I think that this is several systems failing at once, um, which don't in any way require, nor do I imagine, although it's possible that there's you know a, a single conspiracy at the center. It doesn't require that. It's just a, a, a massive failure of systems and and sense making. And you know, the CDC I think just last week or so sort of repeated this this absurdity that. Um, that racism is the is the biggest public health threat, and it helps no one, but it appeases people in the short term. And while that's happening, what other nefarious progress is being made? Well, we'll find out. I don't know right now, but I think we'll find out. There's a question I really want to ask you before we transition to the, the Q&A portion, because I heard you talking about it, kind of riffing with Brett about it, um, kind of how the algorithms create different ecosystems. That's something mm. I've been thinking a lot about, particularly during COVID and, and feeling that a lot of these narratives, like what I see is all these different ecosystems and the narratives never really meet. Like we, I, I share a, an interest in the lab leak hypothesis and I've talked to Brett a little bit about that. And I've been trying to do a piece about it simply because I, I just see that on one side, it's considered like a conspiracy theory. And on the other side, it's become established truth. And it, it's very difficult to find people on the, what you might call the, the sort of consensus mainstream side to actually come and talk about it. And, and I see lots of these different narratives being completely fragmented. And I, what I worry about is that we're not seeing, but the marketplace of ideas needs heterodox ideas, but it also needs to test them properly. And my fear is that we're seeing heterodox ideas mixed in with genuinely just completely wrong ideas and are not being tested. And the mainstream is sort of insulating itself from the challenge of those heterodox ideas. Um, 
maybe you might want to riff on on that first. Um, but then I was going to ask about you talked about where you felt that your podcast and your work was being placed algorithmically and that being a problem. But maybe we'll mm. we'll talk about the the ecosystem thing first. Yeah. Well, um, one of my thoughts in hearing you is to is to pose a question back to you. Um, which is, um, so let's see, I'm, I'm not thinking about algorithms, but your, your question is about the ecosystem in which we find ourselves. And, um, you know, this didn't start with COVID. It's being laid bare by COVID and it didn't start with Brexit and Trump, um, but it was being laid bare to some people um, by Brexit and Trump. And I'm sure there are other other indicators in the world, but those are the two big ones that loom large for those of us in the English speaking world, I think. Um, and, you know, my question back to you is, okay, so you, know, you were um, actively in mainstream media, uh, you know, during sort of Brexit Trump uh, era times. And, you know, what, what did you see that was changing? Like, I don't know, I don't know at what point we we were actually um, able to cross ecosystems and listen and report back on what we heard in our own ecosystems to use, to, to kind of use this analogy, and not be immediately blasted as um, as traitors to the cause. Um, mm. You know, certainly if I if I think back, you know, so I'm 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 old enough to remember Reagan, uh, and uh, I was I was a teenager, but. Um, you know, that was, he, he was a very polarizing figure. In my own family, uh, one of my parents voted for Reagan and one of them didn't. And they had, you know, they, they canceled each other's votes. And that I think is um, important in terms of uh, a developmental environment in which you see the disagreement over fundamental politics doesn't necessarily mean that you hate each other, right? Or that you can't listen to one another. Uh, but the, it also felt as, as, horrifying as the Reagan landscape felt in, in, in the American left, which is the part of the landscape that I was paying more attention to, even though I adored my father, who was, who was a, a Reagan voter. Um, it never felt the degree of what is going on now. And I don't, you know, I don't know if it, you know, then with, in the U.S., which I'm more familiar than um, with British politics, although in the 90s, my parents were living in Britain. And so I have some sense of what's going on then. But, you know, Newt Gingrich helped further polarize. Frankly, so did Clinton. Clinton won, you know, Bill Clinton. Um, but, you know, what, it still feels like there was a, there's a series of step functions and that something discreet and maybe irreversible happened. Um, in like the mid, early mid teens. And I don't have a great sense. I know sort of in, in, in the social world, that was a moment when, you know, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff have pointed to like, that was when um, trigger warnings and safe spaces on campus started to happen. And that was when I began to see some of my students start to use some of that language as well. That was when a lot of students were on uh, mood altering drugs. Um, that would have been, you know, the, the rising class of people who had been raised entire, you know, who are entirely net native, screen native. Um, so there's, there's something there, but there's something else politically and I don't have a bead on it. And I'm wondering what you think. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you see, I, I before you mentioned Jonathan Haidt, I was thinking back to him because he said he feels like it. he dates it back to about 2013, 2014, that exactly. something significantly changed in terms of the, um, the all-encompassing nature of the split. And that even back in the Reagan times, people would disagree, but they would, they would, it was, it was happening within a framework of, if not respect, then at least kind of understanding or something. And that's lost. Like for me, it feels like the guardrails have been lost. So it's now not just that these people are wrong, it's that they're evil, that they're bad, that there's something fundamentally wrong with them. Like, and, and I think part of it is that social media has allowed the spread of really toxic behavior patterns. And that's psychological splitting. That is kind of like the, the most dangerous like the most dangerous way of looking at the world, which is which is literally a psychological splitting that comes from um, serious disorders, I think has leaked out and it's influenced everybody. I think that's part of it. Maybe, I mean, there may be a trade-off built in to to multiplicity, to having 
to having, you know, the more voices, the more experiences you have, which, which is the world that we live in. And, you know, we, except for a very few, few, uh, uh, you know, very few people, people aren't arguing for a return to any kind of homogeneity, nor in the case of the U.S. was it ever a country that was, um, that was intended to be that way. Um, but it is more and more difficult to know what the shared framework is when um, you are effectively a global, not so much a melting pot, but kind of, you know, stir fry, you know, where, you know, we would like to be able to retain our individual identities, but also come together as a, as a whole. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> this analogy is going to go off the rails pretty quickly, but, you know, if we, if we can aim to be, you know, fusion cooking in which we, we still retain identity and are still identifiable, I think, I feel like that's the goal. And, um, the pushes and pulls are around, to some degree, a loss of understanding of what what that goal might be. Like, and and maybe maybe it is that we we don't have a collective understanding of what we're hoping for. And I I feel like, kind of explicitly, that's what the Brexit arguments have been about, right? Like, what what is Britain? And to some degree, that's how Trump tried to frame his his campaigns. Um, you know, it was it was less explicit and he would claim that's not what he was doing, but there, but there were um, a, attempts to recover something that was simpler, frankly, and that is not going to be possible anymore because we do not live in those simpler times. And I don't think, I don't think there's an analogy um, for, you know, Trump and Brexit in that way, that there is uh, one of the answers over in Brexit that was inherently a simpler answer. Um, but the, um, as Brent has pointed out many times, that second A in MAGA, that Make America Great Again, harkens back to a, a fictional past in which um, we all lived with white picket fences and uh, nuclear families and a pot roast in the oven. And, you know, maybe that's not exactly what it calls up for everyone, but uh, it's that's certainly not a past that um, a lot of people ever had access to. So how do we how do we move forward in which those people who want that and other people who want something else that doesn't infringe on the rights of the other groups um, can all get those things um, without without creating fictions about history um, that leave some people feeling you know, deeply unheard and therefore like legitimately hurt, not, um, you know, destructively anarchically hurt, and, you know, destroying police stations as is you know, still happens, still happening in the city that I'm living in. Um, but, you know, legitimately hurt if you feel like, why did my history have to be erased in order to, to move forward? That, that shouldn't be necessary. And, my last question before we go to the, the Q&A, I just want to return a little bit to the, the, the idea of, because I know that you and Brett both um, are looking at alternative narratives, looking at heterodox narratives. Do you have a sense of what the, do you, do you feel a sense of, um, I don't want to use the word responsibility, but what do you, yeah, I'd say, I'd say, and this is something I wrestle with a lot, like what are the responsibilities of all of us? I know it's something that Eric talks about a lot as well, that a lot of the responsibilities that seem to be placed on creators come from established uh, media centers who inherited those from others, whereas a lot of us have kind of built our platforms from hand. So it may not be a, a sort of one-to-one -one appropriateness, but what do you think are the obligations incumbent on on you as as um exploring alter, alternative narratives but of all of us in the kind of alternative sense making space hmm. i don't know i'm not sure i i don't have an answer to that right away you know the our obligations as individuals um and as self identified members of groups are certainly overlapping but not entirely the same and this you know this is one of the main tensions right now is, you know, how do we, how do we understand the, the costs and the benefits of acting as individuals and as members of groups, you know, whether it be with regard to, you know, vaccination or taking part in protest um, or, <clears throat> or, you know, related to the first one, but, you know, expecting teachers to go back into the classroom um, so that students aren't, so that children aren't isolated um, during critical developmental periods. You know, who, you know, who, 
there will be those who suffer from decisions that are good for the group always. So that that is that that is the case. And I think I don't think I'm really answering your question here, but for me, <clears throat> it's maybe it it may be the most fundamental misunderstanding now um, that people on the so-called right, and I'm not sure I believe in the terms anymore, the right and the left, conservatives and liberals, but people on, on the so-called right um, tend to um, talk about individual rights and to the exclusion of group rights. And people on the left tend to talk about group rights to the exclusion of individual rights. And it is, as in all things, in trade-off relationship. And where we put that slider is um, up to us as individuals, and that will define things like where we fall out on policy decisions and who we vote for and whether or not we choose to run for something like school board because we just can't take it anymore because in our in you know in the place where we are, it's leaning too far this way or this way, you know, regardless. Um, but the the narratives at the moment are so are so uninteresting, I guess. You know, they don't, I, I, I love narrative from way back. I'm a, I'm a fiction enthusiast and I'm, I've, always, I've always got something that, that I'm reading and usually watching too, some long form fiction, usually at this point with, with Brett and our boys. And um, most of the stories being told right now are just so implausible and ridiculous and uninteresting. And, you know, that, that comes in the form of like all, all white people are white supremacists and goes all the way to, you know, if you, if, if you question any of the decisions coming out of the who or the CDC, then you are an anti-vaxxer and probably a fascist, you know, it, they're just, they're just not plausible stories. And I guess I'm, continue to be dumbfounded. And I think it's my responsibility not to be in to figure out how to, what a better response is, but that anyone's buying it, that people are falling prey to those sorts of, you know, very basic tribal narratives of you're with us or you're not. You believe this thing and therefore we expect you to adopt all these other things. That's, that's the ideology. And if you don't believe this one thing, then we know what a, all the other things you believe and, uh, and we hate you for it and, and you, you, you're evil. Um, so really, really destroying that dynamic. And it is a kind of narrative, but that dynamic seems um, to be one of the highest goals here. And I think, and I, and I guess then I didn't know that that's where I was coming around to, but I think that is part of what you're trying to do and what we're trying to do and what, you know, a lot of us in this this space, whatever exactly that means, is trying to do is um, have open conversations in which everyone is invited and um, people should disagree. And you, know, you should be surprised if you agree with absolutely everything you hear at any given, say, hour of conversation. Um, you know, maybe even including from your own mouth, right? Like maybe it would be, it'd be good for, you know, all of us to be able to talk freely enough to try out ideas and be like, oh, wait, Actually, I don't. I don't think I do think that. I said that, but I don't think I do think that. Even if it's five minutes later, or five hours, or five months, or five years, um, mm. so that that I think is a responsibility. And I think I think with regard to that one, I think we're doing it, and I hope that more and more people do. Yeah, that that's a really interesting um, comment that you just made about my my sense is as well that the. The social media, one of the unexpected consequences of social media is that it's made it much harder for us to do that because we establish ourselves with a certain perspective, whether that's on Twitter or whether that's on Facebook or whatever it is. And then we calcify around those positions a lot more readily. Um, and that's a fascinating topic. Maybe we'll come back to it at the end because I did. we are going to come to the Q&As now. But that, that, that's really interesting as well. I feel like we almost like calcify around our, our worst ideas because of that um, phenomenon. Yeah. No, absolutely. And social media makes it easy. At least the, um, gosh, is there traditional social media? I guess there is, but um, yeah, I've never been on Clubhouse, but you know, that it's, it's trying out something else, which is more ephemeral. And I guess, you know, there've been things like that, like Snapchat, but you know, anything like Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, where you put something out there and then it's, it's how you're defined. And actually I was, I'm, we write about it in, in, in our book, A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, this exact, this, there's a problem. The younger you are, the more the problem is. If you have established some piece of yourself in, in a timeline and then um, 
if you're anything early in development, you look back in a year or two and maybe you're not living up to the highly curated and perhaps photoshopped version of yourself that you put out there and now you feel you're a failure. Um, and, you know, we all have, I think, a right to have our mistakes disappear if we have not hurt anyone and if we have, um, you know, apologized when that was necessary and been forgiven and all of this. But um, we're, we should all be allowed to experiment and to try things out and then move on and not have every single thing that we ever did follow us around. And social media makes that really hard. Yeah. So we are going to come to the Q and A's. I'm just dropping the question sheet into the chat again. So if you'd like to go there and just add your initials to any question that you particularly like, um, we're going to ask Zach to uh, Zach. If you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask the first question. Just to be clear, this is Zach Parsons, not Zach McKinney, <laughs> right? This is Zach with a C, not Zach with a CH. There we go. And Heather's got her own Zach, who may be around here too, as well. Um, so this uh, question's first. Thanks, Dr. Hying. This is this is amazing. Um, this goes back to your uh, one of your previous hats that you've worn, um, and this is coming from a former adjunct professor. So, mm. can you speak to the adjunctification of higher education and the potential business <laughs> models to capitalize on the relatively high supply of graduate degrees on the market, or ask another way? How would you build your own analog to a university in the 2020s? Mm. Boy, that's important and giant. Um, I will say that one of the things that Evergreen did right, I'm going to start by, by using that implausible opening. Um, one of the things that Evergreen did right um, was in its treatment of adjuncts. Uh, so we, you know, we had a tenure system that we didn't call that because Evergreen didn't call anything what everyone else called it. We were, we were not tenured, we were converted, literally. Um, but, um, but those of us who were tenured or tenure track, uh, unlike, uh, and, you know, and we did, we did have adjuncts and we didn't call them that, but whatever, um, adjuncts, adjuncts did not have the job security, um, but in every other regard, they were treated the same way. So um, until the very last few years, um, they actually made exactly the same amount of money as tenured and tenure track professors. And they had, um, you know, again, not the job security, no, no three year, six year, and then lifetime contract, um, but had the same governance rights um, and, you know, votes if they showed up at a faculty meeting and there were votes having to do with, you know, hire, you know hiring, firing, anything that wasn't personal to that individual. Uh, they had all the same um, rights, and um, this, uh, you know, there's a there's a positive and negative to that, of course. And I think a little bit of that played into the destruction of Evergreen because people without a long term um, interest in the success of the college um, ended up voting for a lot of the woke ideology that that went awry. And so there's something to be learned about there too. That it felt like this is the wave of the future. Like this is how all the rest of the university should be treating adjuncts. We should be paying them at the same rate. And so we got unionized and I think the pay rate went down to 90% of um, the tenure track faculty and tenured faculty, but that's still you know, way higher than anywhere else, right? Um, and there were no more teaching expectations. It was the same teaching expectation across the board for everyone and teaching was what we did. Um, but having people be able to vote on things about the long-term future of the college when they explicitly had um, no long-term investment in the college um, turned out to be a gameable system, right? So, so that part of it, that part of the, you know, sort of hyper-progressive politics of the school, I think was actually an error. Um, the, the pay equity was terrific and it really did allow people to make as much of a living as any of us were. Um, but again, without the job security, which is always, you know, that is the thing that distinguishes adjuncts. Um, in terms, you know, I, what we need is a system that isn't, to, that isn't the business model. And I don't know what that is. Uh, for a year or so, actually, when, when Brett and I were in London with David uh, for the Rebel Wisdom Summit, we were then working uh, with some people on trying to figure out what an alternative system of higher ed might look like. And as COVID, as COVID came down, um, that sort of, that scattered. Um, and so we're not actively on that project now, but it is long-term. One of the things that I'm 
most interested in. I think the evergreen the evergreen model of full time engagement with with programs and with, therefore with students um, was extraordinary. But of course, um, a lot of what academics are doing is research, and so you know how do you play off the teaching and research um, things against each other? And I, you know, Britain is different, and I don't know as much about exactly what the funding situation is there. But in the U.S. Um, NSF and NIH have uh, basically helped make the US until recently um, leaders in the world of science and technology and helped create this problem because you've got this, you know, this stack of perverse incentives on top of one another where, you know, I mean, I, I, I can tell that you know what I'm talking about. And actually, before I go on, what, um, what field are you in or were you in? Uh, I was teaching in social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship. So I don't know as much about that, but it's you know it's not exactly in, in liberal arts, but um, but you'll be familiar with what was going on in STEM, which is that um, increasingly through the boy, I I think like eighties nineties aughts, basically um, the science that was rewarded by administrators was big science that took that cost a lot of money and required a lot of instrumentation and um, a lot of time because that required giant grants and the overhead from the grants went to the administration. So I, I actually spent a year between my bachelor's degree and my PhD working in a grants office at UC Santa Cruz. So I got like the inside baseball on grants administration for a year before going into grad school. And I believe at that point, the overhead rate at Santa Cruz was 63%. And I may be wrong about that, but 63% of any of any dollar earned from you know brought in from NIH or NSF went directly to the to the university and that you know that's great it meant that you had a world class university for you know the the paths and the libraries and you know the personnel and all of this it's great at one level but what that means then is that um, all the science that doesn't take a lot of money gets neglected and so you had the falling in um, in rank and in um, in privilege, basically, of the kind of science that I want to do, which is explicitly low tech and doesn't take money, um, of math, of theoretical work that's basically you know your brain and a pencil, um, and of course um, the all of the work that's over in um, you know some social science takes a lot of money, but the humanities and the arts, the legitimate humanities, the legitimate arts, get way undervalued in a system where the university is is funding itself through the overhead on the big science and tech grants. So, you know, how do you undo that? You know, we do want big science and tech to happen, but we don't want it to happen at the exclusion of, you know, small or, you know, basic um, science and tech. And we certainly don't want it to happen to the exclusion of arts and humanities and everything else. Um, so, you know, there needs, the market cannot continue to play as large a role as it's playing in how it is that, um, faculty are getting um, chosen, like who to hire, what kind of things to hire, who gets promoted, who gets released from teaching. And you know what that does is it frees all the people who then become activists to take all these governance positions. And that's literally what happened at Evergreen. You had all these people with no other power who are like, well, I'm just going to go into governance and we're going to become a giant voting block. And hey, look, we can destroy a place. And I think without knowing much of the specifics of what's going on anywhere else, I think that's probably a large part of what's happening there because the powerful, well-respected scientists with the big grants are encouraged by administration, don't pay attention to what's going on over there. Just keep your head down. Please keep bringing on those grants because you're literally keeping the place humming. And it means that the people with perhaps the best skill set to figure out what this is and to see it and to stop it are literally paying no attention because the incentives are not there to pay attention. So I didn't propose any solution there, but I laid out a bunch of the particular problems that I know exist. Um, uh, I don't know no, if you wanted to follow you. up. Yeah. No, that was, you did, you, you reframed some things that I had not considered at all, which is exactly what I was sort of hoping for. So when, if you do come up with that big aha, you know, <laughs> let, let David and Rebel Wisdom know about it as well. Yeah. One thing, one thing I would say is that um, I have um, I have written and spoken about this a little bit. So um, I've got a piece called "On College Presidents" in a journal called Academic Questions, which I think is I think is out there. If not, I think it's on my webpage. If it's not out um, available through the journal, and then I gave a talk at Oxford in um, 
oh, I guess right after the the Rebel Wisdom or right before the Rebel Wisdom thing back in May of 2019, um, in and which is also out there and you can find it on my website um, on effectively what has grass what has gripped the academy and they were expecting me to talk about just the woke gripping but I talked about the money I talked about the money and 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 the problem with the with the grants as well there. Well, thank you. We, it's obvious that you care so much about this. So really, when you, when you have that breakthrough, <laughs> let's sure bring her back, good. David. <laughs> no worries. We'll do. So we're going to switch from education to uh, sex and gender, which is something that you have talked about before in Rebel Wisdom as an evolutionary biologist. And it's a question from that she's asked if I can read for her. Um, it is reasonable to claim that gender dysphoria is real. It is also reasonable to claim that sex hormones in utero will have a range of effects on the brain. What is more puzzling to me is why your discussion so far imply that the latter is the only or best explanation for the former. Clinical psychologists such as Ray Blanchard and J. Michael Bailey have offered alternative psychological explanations, including autogynephilia, which is still consistent with being truly dysphoric. Are there good reasons for rejecting these alternative, potentially simpler explanations other than being incompatible with the born in wrong body narrative? Mm, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I don't, um, I'm not super familiar with them, but I know, I, I know the, the hypotheses broadly and Ray Blanchard and have, have respect for him. And I don't reject, I don't reject that hypothesis. Um, largely when I talk about you know, and the, and the sex and gender and trans stuff is a set of hills that I will will die on um, because it, it is so, so <laughs> completely in evolutionary space and in space that I've been thinking about since I was an undergraduate, you know, doing research on since I was an undergraduate. Um, those people whom I have known who are, uh, who are what I understand to be truly trans um, I do not think have the autogynephilia, and I don't even remember if I'm pronouncing it right. I've got the whole word there. I feel like I may have dropped yeah. a syllable. Just, just maybe um, to, should we say what that means? It's um, being attracted to yourself as the opposite sex. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, and I will, I will probably butcher this, but I guess the, the Blanchard, and I can't remember the, the other name that, that you read there, but his at least, and maybe their hypothesis is um, that people are one of the reasons that people become true trans as opposed to any of this performative stuff or, you know, social contagion or any of the other reasons. But the true trans phenomenon uh, is sometimes explained by their hypothesis as um, exactly as you say, David, um, being sexually attracted to the idea of yourself as the, as the sex that you were not born to. Uh, Whereas the other one, I don't even know what it, if there's a, a word for it, a name for it exactly, but is sort of broadly understood to be um, feeling yourself born in the wrong body. And that feeling yourself born in the wrong body thing, which is, um, which is an older hypothesis, I think it's been around for longer, and it's something that started to get um, pushed back, I don't even know when, but by some people, um, from a, from a number of different areas. Some of them is the trans activists, most of whom I don't regard as true trans. I regard as activists who are performing something for some reason. Um, and I feel like that was, you know, that was, that's bad faith and they're not interested in actually supporting truly trans people. And um, the idea of wrong body was actually just offensive to them. And so they resisted it. And then there were some people who were pushing back, like I think, probably, although I don't know if he actually did, Blanchard and adherents of his hypothesis who said, yes, sometimes, but sometimes there's also this other explanation. And I suspect actually that there are, gosh, in fact, I, I think I know that there's more than those two um, hypotheses for you know what explains true trans. Um, and God, I think I talked about this with Megan Murphy recently, and I haven't, I mentioned it there and I haven't looked it up since. Um, there is, for instance, an actual genetic um, error uh, known from a tiny group of people in Haiti. I think it's Haiti, it might be Dominican Republic, um, 
wherein in this one village, there is an incredibly high rate of, of trans people. And it turns out to be we, like, we actually have a mechanism on it. We actually can see, and I don't remember all the, all the particulars, um, but there's actually a genetic reason for it. And so, um, you know, that that's a, that's a third explanation, but that's again, more like born in the wrong body. Like, you know, brain sex doesn't abide by, um, anatomical and physiological sex and chromosomal sex and, um, and, you know, the gametes you produce, you know, at, at base, that's, that's what it is. It's, you know, it's the gametes that you could or did or will produce, um, that is descriptive of what your actual sex is. So I guess I would say just, I don't reject that. I don't know as much about it. I don't know any people who have told who, who are trans and who appear to me for whom that is the explanation. Um, and whereas I can say, you know, when I get pushback from, for instance, rad femmes, uh, with whom I am in, you know, some alignment, um, on, on things, but who say, what do you mean trans is real? There's, you know, it, it's not real. I can say, no, it is. I, I know people for whom I am absolutely certain um, they were miserable and could not do anything else in their lives to uh, to resolve the disconnect between what their brain was telling them and what they un what their actual sex was. And you know, furthermore, to a person of those people whom I know, they don't think that they have actually changed sex. Right, like it, it is the, there is an attempt to bring their understanding of their self into as much alignment as possible, um, but they aren't actually confused about what is true. Um, and um, so, yeah, I don't I don't talk about the the Blanchard hypothesis just because I don't know people um, with it, and so I I feel like I have less to say about it. Awesome, right. great. So Ella White, you're up next. Thank you. So. Well, I, I'm a fellow in higher education as well. I was teaching English language at a university in London and then COVID happened and then redundancy happened and now I'm shifting. But English and the higher mind and teaching people is super part of my who I am and who I've come to be. And this thing of building better brains, which I think you and Brett do amazingly, is also really important to me. Um, so the question is, as a fellow in HE, I deeply value the way you and Brett model good scientific thinking. And it often feels to me like one of the only ways that we can build better brains, given the current shit show in education systems and mainstream media complexity and so on. I'm wondering how much you feel it is actually changing things. And if you have much real time evidence of the potential and the good that it is doing. Um, I know in my own life that my own, my cognitive functioning and the way that I've modified and shifted my approach to my own thinking has changed as a result of listening to you two dialogue so this kind of this this way that you have of sharing it in a relational capacity with one another but also as a way of thinking about kind of almost anything I think is brilliant and I just I just wonder you know I'm, I'm ever hopeful but I also love evidence so I just wonder if you can evidence it in any way <laughs> yeah oh well thank you it's um that, that means a lot. Um, I have, I have a lot of anecdotes. I don't have data. Um, <clears throat> I could, at this point, we've heard from enough people that I, you know, one or both of us or someone else, <laughs> preferably, I could go through um, sort of comments and emails and all the ways that people reach out to us um, with a hypothesis in advance and 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 call that and make it into a, a data set. But um, I haven't made that attempt. And so, um, you know, I'm thinking entirely anecdotally. Um, I have not actually heard before the particular thing that you just said, which is that you are modifying um, some of I don't know exactly what you said. You're modifying some of what, some of how you go about things. That's 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 not quite what you said, but it's that's close. Um, and that's amazing. Like that, that's wonderful. It's, you know, assuming <laughs> assuming that you feel that what you're doing now is more effective and and you know more generous, more analytically successful, more creative, whatever it is that you're trying to be better at um, than it was before. Um, that is exactly 
what both Brett and I often separately and sometimes together were doing and honed our ability to do at Evergreen for, in my case, 15 years, in his case, 14 years. Uh, it is it is precisely what we're doing. It's part of why the model there um, was so amazing of having full time full time with your students. And then, you know, we also dragged them into the field and, you know, just went sort of above and beyond in terms of the amount of time we spent with them. You actually, it, and I've said this before, but um, teaching at Evergreen made me less of a misanthrope. I used to have really no faith in humanity. And um, I didn't, I always preferred the company of my cats, always. I just like, if, if given a choice, certain certain individuals, of course, I would I would enjoy being with, but the idea of spending time with strangers would never have had appeal and um, teaching undergraduates at Evergreen changed that because it became utterly clear how much almost every person has to offer. And it so often comes in a package that you don't know. So that ends, you know, much to our surprise. And we pivot and now have, you know, we can't do with the, with the rare exceptions like this. And hopefully we can come back to in-person events at some point and so have opportunities mm -hmm. sometimes, but um, we pivot with the end of our professorships and then with COVID to speaking to thousands of people as if they're sharing with us, but of course, you know, we, we it's one way, it's unidirectional. And so it's missing this huge piece that was present in our teaching, uh, which is that, you know, we did, we both did these like three hour interactive lectures a couple times a week. And that sounds to people who have been in lectures like that must have been hell, but it was, it was conversations. And, you know, Brett and I lectured very, very differently. We have very different styles. Um, but the thing that unified them was the back and forth and the here, we're going to explore things. And, oh, that thing that you just said, you know, Deborah, Sam, whoever it is, we all know each other. We all know each other's names. Um, I don't think that's right. Here's why. Oh, you do think it's right. Tell me why you think so. And, and you, you could do it in real time. So um, that is obviously missing from these conversations, but we're reaching orders of magnitude more people. And so I am, I'm thrilled to know from you and from the, you know, at this point, thousands of people who we hear from um, with some regularity that that people are listening and, you know, maybe they came for the talk about, you know, the woke revolution or they came to, for the talk about COVID or they came to talk about nature, you know, whatever it is, whatever got them in the door. But very often people say, oh, well, I, I stayed because you're engaging each other in a way that I don't actually remember seeing people engage each other. And... Um, and actually, this is something that we were able to see in our classrooms as well, that um, I loved teaching alone. And I had one other teaching partner whom I adored as well. And um, and Brett also taught alone with other people as well. But when we taught together, the thing that was powerful that we never saw coming was we could say, or usually we actually didn't say it explicitly, and then the students would discover it. Um, we, you know, we would be clear with them that we're married, and um, they should assume that we're happily married. Um, but you know, that's for them to decide, I guess. Um, but we would actively disagree with one another in class. Mm -hmm. We would push back on each other uh, and say, I don't, I don't see it the same way. Here's why. And we're not, we're in the same field, right? So we were engaging in intellectual disagreement from the same perspective, basically. And there could be no confusion as to whether or not that disagreement was because we had personal dislike for one another. Right. And so the fact that we were married was ju just made it easy to dismiss one hypothesis off the table. Like, oh, you're just disagreeing because you don't really like him. Like, nope, that's not what's going on. And so that um, that I think does actually um, communicate that that is conveyed by what we're doing. Um, so, you know, I don't I don't have evidence in the form of data, but I have a lot of anecdote and I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that it's even more widespread than I know. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And um, just keep doing what you do. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. So the next uh, most upvoted question is Levi. Levi, are you still with us? I don't see you on my screen. Yes. No? Yes, I am, yep. David. Great. Cool. Hello, Heather. Hi, Levi. Hi, Levi. So I'm looking for some ways to push back against the woke movement and to present something different and I currently support your podcast and Rebel Wisdom and a few other groups through financial contributions and I repost content occasionally. 
and I have conversations with my friends on these topics. Uh, and also most of the communities that I teach in that I'm a member of are progressive, like authentic relating and mindfulness communities. Mm-hmm. And I also find a good portion of my clients through social media presence. I don't feel ready or capable at this point to push back in these large communities or to, you know, make content or have a podcast. And I'm concerned of, you know, potentially losing some clients and being outcast from online communities and local communities here. So I'm looking for some recommendations of ways that I can lean into pushing back a little more mm-hmm. without completely blowing my life up. Yeah. Um, I wish I had an excellent answer for you. Um, I, and I don't, um, I think that you, what you are describing is fairly common I believe. And again, you know, I'm speaking from abundant anecdote rather than from an organized data set, but um, both Brett and I, and I know other, I'm sure David too, like we hear, we hear people with stories like yours a lot. I know that this isn't right. I know that what is happening and the shutting down of discourse is not, you know, this, this way, this will not end well, but given who my clientele are, given what I am dependent on um, for my salary, for my health care, whatever it is, um, I cannot be public about it. What, how do I, how do I have integ- maximal integrity? How do I, um, you know, feel when I go to bed at night, like I am doing as much as I can without um, putting myself at risk such that I render myself completely hopeless. You know, like, you know, it it would do no one any good for you to find yourself without an ability to support yourself um, because, because you felt an individual responsibility. And so I think keeping that in mind is, is paramount. And that's not a great answer, but the keeping in mind that you need to be maximally functional and productive in the world, however it is that you define that, again, assuming that it doesn't, you know, impinge on other people's ability to be functional and productive in the world, um, is actually necessary for you to do the other stuff. And so prioritizing that does not suggest a betrayal of your values, does not suggest that you're being, you know, weak or cowardly or or anything like it. So, um, you know, sharing content um, when you feel that you can, you know, there, I, I think that, um, yeah, it, the, the things that you said that you did, I think are, are terrific and you're asking for more, um, as, as you will know, you know, given what you've said about who you are, um, there, there are things that, you know, rebel wisdom and the Brett and I produce that will, will more easily trigger people. And there's stuff that will less, it will not trigger people. And, you know, you, you slide in with um, what, you know, just a discussion of coyotes or, you know, or, you know, or whatever, um, such that people become accustomed to hearing conversation that sounds not like what they're used to. So, you know, one, One thing that occurs to me, and I I don't think that I advocate for this, but one thing that is a possibility is um, effectively keeping two sets of books, you know, in social media and having an account in which you, you know, follow the same people and sort of, you know, try to get some, some movement and then be, be sharing some of the things that you don't feel that you're able to um, as, as yourself, as, as your primary existence. I don't, I don't like that, right? Because it it feels like it it I mean it's literally duplicitous at one level. Um, but it there might be a way to do it um that feels that feels like it can bring you into a hole the way that at the moment you can't because you you're already having to live these two lives, one of which is public facing and so is conveying something that's incomplete about what you understand to be true about the world. I don't know when I interact with real people now. Um, it's, of course, we're all masked, so who knows? But like, increasingly, there's some chance that they'll recognize me. So it's, it's a little different now. And but um, working with the assumption that I'm anonymous, which I usually work with that assumption, even though it's not always guaranteed to be the case. I increasingly do what actually Brett has done for decades, um, and I engage 
every person I interact with, if there's not a line behind me, you know, at the store, at, um, you know, at the doctor's office, the front desk person, um, in some real way that isn't just small talk. And at least in Portland right now, the number of people who quickly are grateful to have the veil fall away and to say, I can't believe what's going on with the leadership here. And how do we help the homeless while getting our city back? And why isn't, you know, what can we do to actually, um, you know, shut down the anarchists, et cetera, like that, you know, that's a, that's a very local situation, but to listen to the national media or even the local media on what the populace thinks in Portland, you wouldn't think that we were out here. And when I start engaging people in a not pushy and just kind of conveying that I'm open to hearing what people think about something with a, you know, a, a comment that may seem offhand, it's amazing what people will reveal. And so maybe, maybe that's a thing is that in, in everyday interactions, feeling feeling more free to actually find the humanity in the people whom you normally just wouldn't bother with because you're busy and you can't afford to have, you know, under non-COVID times, so, you know, 12 random interactions a day. Um, but I actually find it rewarding and surprising and that, that might be a way in. Sweet. Thank you so much, Heather. Really appreciate yeah. that. Something just came up while I, while you were speaking, Heather, because Obviously, like you and Brett are known for what happened at Evergreen, but that was that was sort of your breaking point. That was something that they wanted to do that that was a kind of like that we're we're not going to go there effectively. So I wonder whether um, did did you push back in any way to things before that? Was there a kind of accommodation or what? How did it? How did you behave in probably what is more like the situation that Levi is describing? Um, where it's not like you're being forced to do something. If you don't do it, you are making yourself a target. How was that before? Because it was one of the most woke environments, I think, probably in the in the country. Yeah, um, that that's a great question. Um, and we we have both Brett and I have spoken a little bit about this. Um, he and I are different. Um, he's he's much more likely to go in um, sort of gunslinging <laughs> to an interaction and to to put up with, with nothing. Um, and I am, I have been historically, although I am increasingly less reticent, um, to, to get involved. And the story that I would tell myself was it will make no difference. And that was in fact, the story told by the three, four, five, six, um, like friends, genuine allies that I had and still have, um, at Evergreen, including the, you know the the one guy with whom I taught a lot, who I loved teaching with, he and I would talk Donald Morsato endlessly, really, about whether or not we thought <clears throat> that Brett's approach um, was going to result in actual changes, uh, or if um, really, or if it was just lost. And in thinking back on those conversations, I can see Donald and myself going. Well, if it's just lost, what what are we doing? Like, shouldn't we be looking for other lines of work then? Because um, n none of us are going to be pleased to be teaching in an environment in which this thing takes over. And so maybe as much as sort of temperamentally, neither my friend Donald nor I were willing to go in as aggressively as Brett did to the faculty meetings and such. What we did do, both of us, and again, you know, a handful of academic staff and, and a smaller number of faculty, um, was have those conversations in the corridors, um, in people's offices with the doors closed, uh, and we and we knew for sure that it was actually a majority of people who didn't who didn't approve of what was happening, and still there it happened. I think because because they could see that it looked like it was a lost cause, I think, that, you know, that as Evergreen blew up, um, despite, I mean, literally despite being two of Evergreen's most popular professors who are beloved by students and um, disliked by, uh, you know, the activist faculty, and that was sort of it, um, somehow we were going to lose our positions there. And so in that climate um, for those 
frankly, I think majority of people who saw it for what it was and didn't approve to stand up would have just been a you know, suicide mission. Um, I think they're wrong. You know, it requires density dependent, right? As so as so many things are, um, you have you have a critical mass of people um, who stand up and say, "I will not abide this," and suddenly there's no abiding this. And two wasn't enough. Two, three, four, depending on how you count. Um, but having I, but when when Brett's and my different approaches um, sort of converged as Evergreen blew up. One thing that I knew for sure from my many, many, many private conversations with people and a few small email groups was I actually know that there is a group, a large group of people out there who sees this for what it is, who agree with us, who um, are quiet. And I'm not totally sure why, although I, I intuit it, but I, I wish they weren't being quiet, but I know it's not because they think this is cool. It's not because they agree. And so that maybe that's the thing that I've taken forward um, is I have the sense still now that the majority of people don't agree with the, the nonsense that is being spouted um, by the, you know, however you want to call it, the, you know, politically correct if we're back in the 90s, the intersectionalists, the, um, the activists, the anarchists, you know, all, you know the wokesters. Um, majority of people don't think it makes sense and don't think it's the way forward, um, but, but they're being quiet. And so talk, allowing them space in conversation to, to say a little thing, to not be quiet, can actually be powerful. And I, and, I, and I know for sure in a few cases, that has been the thing that has helped people then come out of their shell and stop being quiet when I have, when I have encouraged them to talk, just, just by talking to me first. Thank you. So Johnny, Johnny Bra, Bra? Yeah, Johnny Bra, yeah, thanks. Bra. Yeah. Um, hi, Heather. Um, really, really interesting to, to hear you speak tonight. Thank you. Um, I wonder if my question might link a little bit to some of what you've been saying just now. Um, I was just thinking, you know, about how the events at Evergreen sounded very traumatic and how speaking kind of publicly about human biological facts um, seems to attract a lot of hostility these days. So my question is really, how do you kind of stay centered in the midst of all of that? Um, how do you avoid getting caught up in the kind of very highly emotive, the kind of outrage drama and that whole kind of um, getting pulled into a more uh, kind of less productive um, conversation, something that's kind of then more, uh, you know, gets more, po get, get, getting pulled into becoming more polarized yourself in that process? Yeah, good question. Um, I think ev every individual will have a different set of answers to that. And um, I, things would have gone much differently at Evergreen if it had been Brett without me or me without Brett. The fact that we had each other um, and it helps that we are very different in our approach and our personalities, um, but that we knew for sure, no matter what, never had to ask that we had each other's backs. Uh, made that possible in a way that is just, um, it, it's just got to be so much different if you feel that you might be alone, whether or not you have a partner or a friend who you can mostly trust, but you're not totally sure. So the, the fact that, that we did and continue to simply have each other's backs, no matter what, when we disagree with each other, it's fine, but, but you're, we're going to be there. Um, that that's probably the most fundamental thing. Um, at an individual level, uh, you know, I find, I, I had, and I've said this publicly many times before, I'd never been on social media before Evergreen blew up intentionally. I, I avoided it because I, I, I knew that for me, um, it was going to be uh, more, more chaos and pain than it was worth. And I feel certain that that was true. And I also feel certain I, I said to Brett a week into Evergreen blowing up, I guess this means I have to go on Twitter. And, uh, and I, I needed to, and it was the right move. And um, gosh, I believe I said in conversation with British Fe Bridget, hmm, Bridget Fetisi last week, like Twitter is exactly the mess and horrendous place that people said it was. And it's also 
a, a wonderful thing. It's also a, a place of opportunity and figuring out, you know, knowing that as Tristan Harris has, you know, made clear to the world that it is, that its algorithms are designed to addict you and watching how it does it and watching yourself, like having sort of distance. I, I kind of do animal behavior on myself as I do on all the humans I interact with, but sort of, you know, being above yourself as you are on your phone or your computer and um, you pull away and it's five minutes or an hour later and boy, that was time you didn't need to spend um, is super useful if you can retain the honesty with yourself about I'm in it now. Like that, that was not, that was not the best use of my time. That was, that was social media landscape taking over my head. And I, I need to be in charge. Like there's most interactions in my life with human beings. I don't want to be in charge of inherently, but with social media, I need to be in charge of that app. Like that, that algorithm should not be allowed to rule me ever. Um, so personally, um, you know, I, I get outside. If I can move fast outside um, under my own power somehow, you know, if I can be biking downhill fast with nature around me, um, that that brings everything back into focus. That's just curative. And you know, some people won't have the love of speed, and some people, I think, everyone can benefit from from spending time in nature. Frankly, um, but for some people, it will be meditation. I don't. I did. I was lucky enough to spend a few weeks when I was a teenager with Thich Nhat Hanh and a bunch of poets at a retreat, um, learning how to meditate and spending a lot of time doing walking and sitting meditations a day. And I don't do it explicitly now, but for some people that will be it. Writing, playing music, creating, um, you know, pulling yourself out of the, especially the virtual morass where it's not whole people, you know, this, this would be better if we were in person, but this is as close to in person as we can get virtually because I can actually see you and hear your voice. And, um, and that's a lot better than some text on a screen, especially if typed by an anonymous avatar, um, because who knows, you know, who knows what that is and, um, if it'll be the same person or bot or whatever it is, piece of code next week, who's, who's coming at you and trying to trigger you and trying, you know, trying to win, trying to beat the evolutionary systems that we're all laden with, you know, give you the dopamine hit, make you feel bad. And don't let it win. And, you know, know yourself well enough to know what it is that you can do to recenter yourself and, and give yourself that gift as much as possible. Thank you. Thanks very much. It, it, it looks to me like it takes like a lot of courage to stay in the fray and keep a level head and keep doing what you're doing. And it's, it's hugely valued. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, that, that's a really nice note. We're, we're coming towards the end. We've just got one minute left. That's a really nice note to, to close on. There will be an after hours that Clay will be hosting, but we'll hand over to him in a second. But Heather, are there any, do you have any uh, closing thoughts um, that you haven't expressed yet? <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts I haven't expressed yet, David. <laughs> I know. Um, but um, nothing comes to mind here. I've, I've, the questions, such great diversity of, of questions and topics. And um, I mean, I've, <clears throat> since, since meeting you, I think, I think we met, David, here in Portland, probably at the end of 2018, shortly after Brett and I had moved here with our family. And from the very first moment, you and Brett had already met um, in person in Texas, I think. Um, I have been um, delighted by the breadth of topics that you are willing to explore and that you encourage the exploration of. And I think it's something that we very much have in common. And the questions here have been um, indicative of that. So this has been a lot of fun. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films, and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sensemakers get to join our regular Sensemaker Showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions 
the monthly philosophical journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense making. From now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.